So let's get started because it's two minutes after 12. Yeah. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Xue Ming Wan. Yeah, also Sam Wan. So Dr. Wan holds his uh, bachelor's degree from Huazhong Agricultural University in China, uh, a master's from the Ohio State University, and a PhD from the University of Kentucky. After that, he did a postdoctoral training work on the lipid at uh, uh, Louisiana State University. He then established his own lab in 1991 at Kansas State University. He then, um, where he went on to serve as a director of the Cancer Lipid Lipidomic Research Center from the 2002 through 2004, before uh, he moved to um, St. Louis. <clears throat> he then became the E. Desmond Lee uh, Endowed Professor in Plant Sciences uh, and a member of the Danvers Plant Science Center. His lab focused on lipid-mediated signal lipid metabolism, vegetable oil production, and phosphate nitrate use efficiency, and the drought response. For his groundbreaking research in plant biology, Dr. Wang earned many awards, including the um, 2014 Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research and Creativity, and the 2018 George Eigelman Interdisciplinary Award from the St. Louis Academy of Science. Um, and with that, I introduce to you Dr. Uh, Xu Ming Wan. Um, by the way, so during his talk, you can uh, welcome to um, post your questions through the room chat. So after his talk, so you can unmute yourself to ask. So Dr. Wang, welcome. Yeah. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Li Qin, for this uh, introduction. And I'm so happy. Uh, to come here uh, to uh, talk to you about our recent work. And uh, I modified the title slightly, uh, but the overall theme is still to how to improve uh, plant lipid production. Uh, here talk about from lipid offer to lipid clock uh, interplays. Uh, Uh, one of my uh, lab's interest, uh, key interest, is to understand how lipid affect crop production. We particularly focused on the lipid signaling, the how lipid function as mediators in plant growth and the stress responses. Uh, then one of this major outcome from this study is to how can we actually uh, improve uh, lipid production in plants. And this is very different from we humans, you know, where we try to cut down lipid production as much as we can. But in plants, uh, we actually want to most photosynthate go to lipids uh, if we could. And because there are huge uses in the food, health, and also renewable industries uh, with uh, the uh, use of the lipids. Uh, today, what I would like to is give you three kind of interlaced talk, uh, stories. You know, one will start to introduce how the lipid turnover is important in lipid production, and then move to transcription or regulation of lipid degradation, particularly during the settling uh, development process. And then how uh, lipid and uh, molecular clock interacts, and what are the uh, implications of those uh, uh, interactions? Hopefully, what it, I'd like to you, what you like take away from this, is this uh, 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 is a kind of upper calm theme that the metabolite regulation transcription uh, is a very efficient way for linking the cellular metabolism or correlated cellular metabolism uh, gene regulation and the organismal response to changing environment. A larger uh, takeaway message I'd like to from my talk will be this new or alternative ways to look how or think about how we could improve 
lipid production. Uh, anytime uh, if you have a question, I think, uh, I guess at this moment, probably it's hard to shout it out and uh, uh, just let me know. But here you cannot see my slides and so on. Uh, this is a plant lipid, particularly storage lipid uh, production and also quantity in a very uh, like a simplified form. And when you talk about lipid production, the fatty acid are made in chloroplast and then they're transported into ER where they go through on the very top. This is what we call this uh, uh, Kennedy pathway. It's a nucleotide pathway where the lipids are at the end, you know, uh, made into triglycerides where they're stored in the lipid body. All right. What other aspects, which I think are not getting a lot of attention, particularly outside of a uh, uh, lipid research area, are uh, those where the fatty acid modification uh, happens. So this uh, modification, uh, like the desaturation, like the inundation process, uh, those actually are happens in this uh, uh, use phospholipids as carrier. Basically, the take home message here now is look at this one. Fatty, chloroplasts only make like 16, 0, 18, up to 18, 1 uh, carbon fatty acid. Then the, but the most fatty acid accumulated actually say in soy, in sunflower oil are actually polyunsaturated fatty acid, meaning they are 18, 2, like 18 carbon with two double bonds, 18 carbon with three double bonds. And those actually are coming from using lipids, particularly phosphatidylcholine, it's a precursor to, to for this uh, desaturation process. And also labeling study, you know, metabolic labeling study showed that most fatty acid, which at the end, end up in the tri like triglycerides, actually they go in through phospholipid route. So phospholipid route meaning you just turn over the remodeling, ASO remodeling uh, at the bottom portion, actually is a major contributor uh, to it because the phos for example, the phosphatidylcholine, a uh, short form is a PC, not only provides the uh, a substrate for desaturation, also direct carbon skeleton to either directly make into triacylglycerol through this like a, a PDAT, which is the enzyme, you know, uh, uh, also through other enzymes that like inter uh, the interchange with diacylglycerol. So then the phosphatidylcholine uh, is it, again a major player in the oil production can be metabolized by many different enzymes. Uh, the phospholipases are the enzyme which can hydrolyze a phosphatidylcholine at different positions, like the phospholipase D, which we're going to uh, uh, talk about this later. Uh, it hydrolyzes at this last terminal phosphodiester bond that gives you phosphatidic acid, uh, the free header groups, and the C type of phospholipase, in particular, this long specific. Uh, phospholipase C, we call it MPC. You know, this is a, uh, but this will hydrolyze the common membrane phospholipids at this first phosphodiester bound, give you diacylglycerol, which is this particular portion, and the phosphorylated head group. And then you have an A type of phospholipase, which hydrolyzes the uh, fatty acid groups. Today, what I want to give you is the examples of how this uh, MPC, you know, the long specific phospholipase contribute to the lipid production. In This is a, a group of uh, MPCs in Arbidopsis. There are six MPCs, uh, which has been, uh, uh, our group and other group has been studying this uh, for some time. They have a very interesting diverse subcellular uh, distribution and also functions. And some of those things we just published on, is this like a MPC4, which is uh, isolated. That means you have a fatty acid attached to it. And this can hydrolyze uh, a single phospholipids and the important in the plant adaptation to phosphate deficiency. Then you have this MBC, uh, other MBCs like MBC1, MBC2, they are primarily ER associated. And there's the MBC6, 
and MPC5, which is primarily cytoplasmic, and they also has been shown to be involved in phosphate uh, deficiency response. So one approach we have been looking at this one, and this is in collaboration with uh, uh, Professor Go at uh, Huazong Agricultural University, is to take a genomic approach. You know, what uh, he has developed is this uh, germplasm uh, where they have sequenced the more than 600 rib seed accessions. Yeah. And uh, this has a, uh, accession has a, a large variation from, for the oil content, like from low 30s to mid 50s and uh, very high resolution. And in terms of slips, uh, uh, SMPs uh, and this, yeah. What we did is actually analyze, say, taking some of those family, whole family phospholipase run uh, this uh, association and this uh, haplotype analysis. And what we found is MBC6, or one thing which we found interesting is that, you know, the RIPSIS has a two genome, or A genome, C genome. We found the C genome is a much better contributor to the oil content. And what we found that is MBC6 is associated with, uh, you know, increased oil content and also increased yield, uh, seed yield uh, production here. Uh, so uh, then what we tested is taking those uh, uh, association, then put it into the plants we can actually uh, do functional test. Uh, in this case, we first use Arbidopsis, we, we isolated lockout, we also express those ones, lock their impact on the oil content. And then also we lock the Camelina and uh, in Camelina, we overexpress it uh, and uh, then knock at the oil content. And this diagram shows where we have uh, produced a number of overexpression uh, plants. And they does not seem to have a, a huge morphological effect on plant growth. But then on the other hand, in terms of uh, uh, the, what do you see like this, uh, on the thousand seed weight, the seed weight, uh, we see an increase in seed weight. And also we see an increase the seed oil content, which is at the bottom uh, left. Uh, if you combine the seed wheat, seed yield uh, per plants, you know, in this case, of course, one we did sell yield, this, uh, this is a Danford uh, yield field trial, which is in the greenhouse. We grew a bunch of individual plants, you know, large uh, replicated many times, and then try to take how much each plant produce how much uh, how much seeds is not a, a yield where uh, those of you who traditionally uh, think about it in field. Uh, but anyhow, this combination of this increased oil count and the increases or like uh, uh, the seed production actually need a substantial increase uh, the amount of oil and in this case produced per plant. Uh, so uh, this one we. Uh, but the similar kind of trend also find in Arbidopsis. Uh, so well, on the other hand, you lock it out, actually the, uh, the, the oil content uh, decreased. So this shows then one, then we also, we did some labeling study following where the fatty acid moves and how carbon, uh, uh, we analyzed this uh, uh, metabolic route. What we believe that is that the MPC uh, can actually contribute uh, this diacylglycerol, which is used as substrate for triacylglycerol production, right? And uh, so besides this uh, MPC, the C type of phospholipase, in the early time, early, uh, early we also uh, found that some of the A type of phospholipases, is, they actually involved in the acylcycline and because it, when the fatty acid get room, uh, modified on the PC, say so desaturated on the PC, and they can get it, uh, like a uh, deacylated and then be put into fatty acid pool where it can use it as incorporation into triacylglycerol. So this, uh, this part is called the land cycle. And also some specific D type of phospholipase is uh, they can hydrolyze PC, uh, produce phosphatidic acid, which is a precursor for the making diacylglycerol. So uh, in this series of study, you know, the different family of enzymes, again, each of the enzymes is a family of enzymes. Uh, 
we have identified some of the first specific players and uh, they contribute uh, to the oil production or production. And from uh, this diagram shows the further from further metabolic uh, uh, point of view, you know, uh, and uh, at the same time, we have been interested in, you know, how the lipid function is a, a mediator in some of those uh, process. If you look at the diacylglycerol that's shown here on the right, and the phosphatidic acid on the left, you know, they are actually are central metabolites. Uh, their production, they uh, actually, they not only use it for the triacylglycerol formation, the seed oil, and also they are major components uh, what the, for the substrate for the synthesis of uh, membrane glycerol lipids. So uh, a number of enzymes, like uh, what some of those are going to, uh, uh, I want you to uh, pay attention to, and then we're going to come back with what say the D type of phospholipases is they can hydrolyze membrane lipids, give you a directly phosphatidic acid. And then the phosphatidic acid can be, you know, dephosphorylated by the phosphatidic acid hydrolase, give you diacylglycerol. At the same time, diacylglycerol can be actually uh, phosphorylated into phosphatidic acid. So, a larger uh, aspects in terms of how one would manipulate those enzymes, the impact lipid production could, due to some of those regular aspects, those uh, in, uh, metabolites can actually play. So uh, here I want to show some of those, like say a phosphatidic acid uh, as an example. It's very highly dynamic uh, metabolites. And showing here actually are say, uh, uh, this is this, uh, like uh, under different stress conditions. If you look at this meat or this basil, that means the Arabidopsis plants, which is not a stressed. Uh, uh, but then once it's stressed and the lipid, uh, many of those uh, lipid metabolites will undergo uh, a flanchiation. Uh, what I want you to pay attention is this yellow bar. This yellow bar shows this level of phosphatidic acid. So this is the work we've done in collaboration with my longtime collaborator, uh, Ruth Welty, who is now running the Lipidomic Center at uh, Kiss State. If you have the passage infection, you see a large increase of PA. If you have this, uh, but depending on the uh, uh, compatible, incompatible interactions, this, the changes is different. If you have like other wounding or, or, or like a cold stress, uh, you see a large increase of phosphatidic acid. It's very, so the basal level, point here now is the basal level PA is rather a uh, small amount in the membrane lipids. But depending on the stress conditions, you see they all change quickly and many of those changes is transitory, like wounding, for example, they will increase and then they will drop to the baseline as plants uh, heals, yeah. So, Somehow, our early study in terms of the plant stress response, we have found that one of the mode uh, for the PA function to regulate uh, the plant process is through the interaction with uh, proteins. As this diagram showed here now, we found that the phosphatidic acid, they can interact with uh, 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 a phospholip uh, this protein phosphatase to C ABL1, which is an elective regulator involved in the uh, abscessic acid response. So this interaction actually can uh, suppress this uh, function, this liquidity factor, and actually promote ABA response. And also the PA can interact uh, with uh, like NADH oxidase, which involved in uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, hydrogen peroxide production and uh, this uh, uh, interaction lead to uh, the production and also perception, depending on which, uh, where the PA is produced, uh, uh, which phospholipase is involved, and then lead to the further activation of the metabolic pathways or, or, or signaling pathways in plant responses. So by those studies, we have identified several proteins. Then we asking, you know, here now, uh, what other proteins actually interact with the lipid metabolites? So we take the two lipid metabolites, uh, like phosphatidic acid and diacylglycerol, 
as a bait and then run this uh, a mass spec based ID. Basically we do use a, a, it's a liposome or a matrix based like a, in particular. So we use a blood, uh, so what proteins actually binds to those lipids and then further locking for the function uh, of those proteins. Uh, we first started with take actually total cellular protein. Uh, in this case, and then identify what uh, uh, some uh, proteins could interact with. Uh, one of the proteins we identified actually quite interesting is this uh, uh, gap DH, the, this uh, glycerolaldehyde dehydrogenase, which is involved in the glycolysis process. And we went to study how the interaction impact the, uh, the glycolysis and also uh, uh, lipid metabolism. Uh, but then from this total cellular protein, normally you find that okay, many of this very abundant protein that were also taken, uh, this one, uh, uh, this interaction is actually very hard to identify some of this regulatory, uh, regulatory proteins uh, because they're more, more normally made in smaller amount. One particular group is this transcription factors, transcription factors. So what uh, Sancho uh, was very capable uh, uh, postdoc, his lab has done is that we uh, take a, 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 the uh, abradopsis transcription factor and express the protein. So it's showing on this very right uh, side, this actually a mixture of about 1,600 transcription factor. You know, that encompasses about at least the 65 or 75 or 80 percent of the total transcription factors you find in abradopsis. Then he picked up this individual column and produces a this is actually, those are the proteins from each column, uh, each, column each colony produced a transcription factor. Uh, so, so by screening this one, so what it binds to it, then actually uh, he identified a number of transcription factors which can interact with uh, phosphatidic acid. One of them, he identified is this, uh, uh, 80 hook motif, uh, motif containing nuclear localized protein. So we went, uh, then he, in collaboration with uh, Guangqin, uh, a laser postdoc in the lab, and characterized this uh, interactions. And one of the interesting phenomenon of, for this mutant is found that uh, there is a, a defect in the early citadine, like a citadine germination, actually not in citadine germination, they can all germinate. That means the radical can all come out. But in this case, say, in the absence of sucrose in the growth media, the root just does not inundate. They are just stay really short here now. In this case, this is of expressed ones. But the uh, lockout tend to be slightly longer. You know, this, this is the wild type. And this, uh, this plate phenotype actually translated into the soil growing. Uh, this actually is very relevant because the establish seedling, a strong seedling establishment is very important for, uh, you know, for the crop, you know, early stage growth and then how the, uh, uh, so this actually tries to, this particularly the early stage growth and this uh, germination, not germination, the seedling growth is slowed down and uh, uh, then the seedling actually gets smaller, weaker, and eventually actually they catch up when you grow those things much longer past the setting stage and this ends catch up very well. Uh, but with Arbidopsis, we know that this is oil seed uh, seeds. So the energy before they can do photosynthesis to, you know, to, to prov uh, provide the phosphatidine growth is coming from lipid metabolism primarily, or lipid degradation. And here, uh, he looked at how this tag amount, you know, during the germination process is consumed because the triacylglycerol is broken down into a stricoa that gets through the glyoxylate cycle, which will make uh, uh, carbohydrates, uh, make carbohydrates. Uh, so then they can, cell wall can be made in a gate before the setting can do the photosynthesis. And you see this wild type the in blue line here, you see the triacylglycerides over the days of inhibition decrease gradually. 
the mutant, he has the two uh, lockout mutant seems decreased even faster. But of expressed ones, it's really retarded. They just keep staying, they're not really broken down triacyl, uh, glycerol uh, for, uh, for well. Uh, but in terms of triacyl glycerol breaking down, and if, uh, this shows here, uh, uh, if you, here if you have the lipid tag stored in the oil body, then this first needs to have been hydrolyzed by the lipase. There's the several lipase has been characterized, like there's a sucrose dependent uh, protein one. This is a lipase. Uh, there's the other, like a, uh, there are five, this larger lipase. They all catalyze this initial step, which hydrolyzes the DAG to the, uh, the uh, TAG to the DAG. Uh, and, but then after the hydrolysis, then they get into the proxosome, they undergo beta oxidation. Uh, they give you acetylcholine, and then, then they can go through the glyoxylate cycle to make uh, uh, carbohydrates. And one of the last enzyme is this, uh, uh, a cat enzyme, which this is the enzyme actually do the xylitic cleavage and release acetylcholine. When he compared the gene expression pattern in the lockout and overexpressed ones, you see, you found here now, you see this group, like the uh, SDP protein, uh, like a DAS5, and also MAR, those are lipases. Those are lipases hydrolyzing TAC into DAC and released fatty acid. And then the last one is this CAT enzyme. This CAT enzyme is actually the last step of the beta oxidation in the proxosomes, in proxosomes. Uh, so, so this indicates that uh, this transcript factor actually uh, suppresses the transcription of those genes, the lipase genes and the beta oxidation genes. And also, this is a uh, electromobility shift experiments, and uh, uh, he did actually to uh, look at how this transcription factor, this is PA interaction with transcription factor. Uh, so this the, showing the example here, one is the lipase, the DAL5 the, the is a lipase, the cat one is, is this last enzyme in the beta oxidation xylase uh, uh, and release the citric-CoA. And uh, without going into the details, basically you find that PA can inhibit this interaction of this uh, protein with the targeted promoter region. And the last thing I want you to pay attention is this, this the different molecular species of PA. Uh, because this is 16-0, PA. This one actually has, does not bind well with the protein uh, or so uh, does not bind well with this uh, 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 AH, HHL4 uh, protein and does not impede uh, this uh, interaction. And on the other hand, this is 18-1 containing PA, which binds well with the transfer factor, actually suppress this mobility shift, meaning they interfere with the transcription, effect, transcription factor with the target promoter interactions. And the, this same pattern persists with the, uh, the CAT enzyme uh, promoter. This, this is a promoter enzyme. So what do we believe this is now, this is interaction of lipid interaction with this is AHL4. Uh, this AHL4 is a suppressor for this uh, lipid degradation during the sitting germ germination and uh, uh, establishment process. Uh, the PA, which is produced often like in the metabolism when seeds start to germinate, because you see either through the uh, the direct degradation of phospholipids, they actually uh, also made through the uh, uh, other process can be then then bind to this uh, HAR4. This actually relieves this uh, suppression. Then this type of interaction then actually promote the overall the hydrolysis of TAG as energy sources so that the sitting can grow and establish, establish. Uh, so uh, I think one of the significance of this study is that, you know, we, this transcriptional regulation of lipid metabolism actually is not that well understood. On the biosynthetic aspects, I think that there are several transcription factors identified which coordinated like say uh, RIN-CORE-1 
This is one good example. And uh, due to the life's work uh, Crystal Benin did, uh, it actually correlates the glycolysis and the lipid production process in the biosynthetic process. But on the lipid degradation aspects and how the transcription, how this is regulated, this process is correlated because there are multiple enzymes required for the lipid degradation. And this will be the uh, first example where this uh, particular transcription, transcription factor actually interact with the lipid metabolite can uh, correlate this is the early stage of hydrolysis and, and the later stage of degradation so that uh, uh, control the lipid degradation during the germination process, acidic uh, growth. A lot of uh, protein uh, signature identified uh, is actually quite an interesting protein. I want to spend more time actually talk about this one. That is the late inundation, uh, late uh, uh, hypocotyl inundation protein, the LHY. For those of you you're familiar with the molecular clock, you know, the LHY and CCA1 are two homologous proteins. They are a uh, key regulator. Those are two MIP transcription factors uh, in this central loop of the regulation of circadian clock. And so the uh, so circadian clock, is, uh, as we know it, is a bunch of transcription factors that go in the fit forward, fit, fit backwards, and this kind of interlock the loop and they regulate this evening and the morning uh, responses in plants. Uh, so uh, in this one, actually, I want to show you more detail because of how we actually study the lipid protein interactions and how we fair, uh, figure out the functions. Uh, so what Sancho did here now, you know, when you're doing this kind of a pour down, so you identify the protein and mass spec, you don't really know the interaction actually happens, uh, say, because of association with something else, because you don't know its interaction with something else to interact with it, or whether it happens in plants or not. So to validate this process, there's some common approach we use. You know, one uh, a quick, dirty experiment, quick, dirty meaning very efficient, quick experiment is a fat of Western blood. So what does this experiment is down next? You say you take a lighter cellular membranes, you blot your lipids, and here show the different type of lipids. Phosphatidic acid, showing here. Then other common lipids like a phosphatidyl or glycerol, elastitol, a phosphatidyl, or, you know, uh, ethanol, uh, ethanolamine, serine, and the phosphatidylcholine. You know, then you can you see the PA binds to it. But then on this left panel, uh, right panel here now, actually is a different molecular species of PA. And here I want you to pay attention, you know, here now you see this, not all the molecular species of PA will binds to it. And I can see this 16060 0, 0 binds away or uh, 18080 0, 0 binds to some, but the 181181, 18, a common molar fatty acid PA, so this two fatty acid actually does not bind uh, the transcription factor like LHY. Uh, well, to verify this, so this is a, a, a membrane blood, and then you may question, you know, this is very artificial, you know, you don't see protein, do not see, see lipids in this way. And then we use liposomal, that's where you make a, a, a globular structure of lipids, which is mimic cell membranes, you do pour down, you know, you pour down, this pour down here now, it shows here now, you see again, 16-0, uh, PA will bind to uh, the LHY. This is the PA, this is a mixture PA, and 18181 PA does not bind well, you know, at all. So this is molar unsaturated. So this shows a specificity of the interaction. Again, it's not, not just a simple artifact. And then in terms of quantification, we use the surface plasma resonance where we can quantify the interaction. And here shows the PC only lipids of vesicles and the PCA plus PA, you see a response. The reason we need to add a PC to it because the PA does not form a liposome. PA is a rather interesting lipids. It forms a capsule-like uh, structure. Uh, uh, so uh, this is in vitro, we show this type of interaction happens. And then we actually want to go step further. Can we actually show this function that isolates this interaction from plants. 
so in this way, uh, one type of approach we did is actually we immunoprecipitate LHY at the right time when it's expressed high from Arbidopsis. Then we analyze what lipid associated with it. And then this shows here now that you actually can see more PA is isolated, co-isolated with the LHY. And here now it shows uh, the total PA content. And this is with antibody, without antibody. And then you have this LHY mutant, which does not make LHY uh, here. So this is one approach we did it. The other approach uh, we show this one is actually will fit into the apodopsis with a fluorescent labeled PA. So this fluorescent labeled PA, so we can isolate PA uh, because this is one you don't need to go through a mass spec analysis of PA, which is rather hard to do. It just extract the lipids, then run a thin chromatography rather. So in this case here now you see uh, we did this with the LHY CCA1, which are two analogous proteins, where your IP precipitate, this is spot is the PA spot. You can see the PA. So this is MBDPA. This is actually a control, all right, loading control. And you see the PA get a core down by uh, these two proteins. Then we use actually other transcription factors, which we know that we showed that does not bind the PA. Uh, this is LUX one, which is also in the circadian clock and is a control where you do see a PA get a copor down. So this kind of semi in vivo data. So you can pull down PA uh, with the L2I uh, in this case. Then to one step further, you know, really want to show this interaction in you know, happens in plants. So what we uh, did here uh, is in collaboration with Professor Zhang at Nanjing Agricultural University. Um, you know, his lab actually uh, made a PA probe, which you can tether to, uh, but this is a thread based probe, which can tether to, tether to a plasma membrane. And you can see this interaction where you see, uh, if you use different lipids and you see this nice response to the PA, you infuse, this in this case is taking actually arbidopsidinins, you infuse lipids, the lipids can be taken up and it shows this response. And also uh, shows we will lock out a D-type phospholipase, which decrease peer production, and you uh, see a less uh, response uh, to, than wild type. So, and this is, so this is the plasma membrane tethered uh, PA sensor. So we, uh, Stribin in the lab, uh, adapted this once by putting a, a nuclear envelope targeted sequence. So this is a thread, and then try to uh, measure whether we can, in this case, what he has done is that he actually just linked an LHY, LHY, which this protein binds to PA, and uh, put it into uh, uh, Arbidopsis. And there she also here now, you see with 18, 16, 0, 16, 0 PA, if you infused into the plants, which can, this probe actually respond. But this 18.1 PA does not bind to uh, uh, LHY for a while, respond like a, a background, respond a background. So all this shows that actually from in vitro, semi in vivo, and also in plant, and we feel now quite confident where the PA indeed binds to this transcription regulator. All right. Then the next question, of course, comes down to what is the significance of this binding? You know, what does it do to the plants? So in this case, we asked several questions. You know, one, what's the effect of PA on the clock LHY CCA1 function? And then what effect of the clock has, you know, uh, to how that, you know, this, uh, you know, what's the PA effect on the this clock factor LHY function? And then what's the effect of PA uh, on this clock output. Here we're talking about it. here to from molecular effect and to the physiological effect and how that actually impact uh, lipid production, lipid metabolism, the three. Uh, so in this case, you know, first experiments, you know, he did, Sanger did is to use this uh, electro, uh, electric, uh, elect, this mobility assay to show the binding again shows like this LHY 
can see this is without, this is TAC1 is the target of LHY. And it, of course, increases uh, this transcription factor LHY, of course, shows mobility shift. And you uh, add in the, um, so, so this just shows uh, this wild type, and this is a mutant. Uh, just show where the binding mobility shift is specific. And if you add the PA, it here shows the increased amount of concentration PA. You see the mobility shift disappeared. That means it suppressed the LHY binding to TAC1 promoter. And this shows a bunch of the controls like a common phospholipase PC and the acidic phospholipase PG, uh, or even the phosphatic acid. And uh, this acidic condition does not compete this binding. This long PA binding, uh, 8181 PA, does not impede this interaction. Then the 160 PA, which binds to LHY, actually can impede uh, this LHY binding to the top promoter. Again, showing a very specific PA uh, lipid species specific effect. Uh, so uh, he actually went to further to look again, look more in plant. Uh, experience here now taking uh, uh, this actually rather complex slides showing here now because the basically take home here is that the PRD is the one produced PA. The PAH, this one is here, PRD is produced PA. The PAH is the enzyme which actually remove PA. And here just shows this PA level changes. Indeed, they produce less PA, more PA. And then he used the, uh, the chip PCR assays to show some of this. If you have producing more PA, indeed you can actually see less uh, that produce more PA. In this case of you have a mutant, double mutant a PAH, you see a less uh, uh, LHY uh, PA uh, the binding with the target promoter. All right, the promoter again, consistent with that. Uh, so then comes to how does this impediment of binding and impact the uh, clock function? Uh, here I have a, a video, you know, we actually uh, monitor this interaction using, uh, oh, so I'll show you here's video here, the way how major the assay, uh, this is, uh, movement of the sedinins. You know, the sedin undergoes a spherilized oscillation. This is a wild type. If you take a mutant, on the other hand, you actually uh, doesn't, so by this kind of oscillation timing, you can uh, calculate, uh, calculate uh, the, the rhythm of this. Uh, so, what the what we have found that if you have an elevated PA, basically that actually lengthens the clock, makes the clock longer. So in wild type is about twenty four hours, and so you have increased PA with PAH, PAH uh, double mutants is about twenty five hours approximately. All right, and this double uh, hour is a mutant, but this just control you have a complement the mutant, and then you restore to about twenty four hours. Uh, then also you can measure the TAC uh, gene expression. Here shows that again, uh, wild type is about 24 hours and the mutant with higher PA is about 25 hours. And we can also manipulate the PA in a different way by using some of those chemicals where you can inhibit the, uh, the kinase, which will reduce the PA formation. And you also you can inhibit, uh, if you reduce the PA, you will actually shorten the clock. See, Wild type is about 24 hours. And if you shorten the PA, what you inhibit the PA production, you get about 23 hours. Again, you can manipulate. Uh, uh, and here it shows some that's just uh, a sort of the control where the clock is function basically the same as wild type. Again, indicate some of those inhibitors uh, which inhibit PA production can uh, shorten the clock. Another aspect here, of course, is to say what this will impact lipid production. We found that, you know, some of those 
look at species actually oscillates in the wild type. And showing here like uh, the specific uh, PG, like specific PA species, not all the PA species undergo the oscillation. But if you lock out the L2I CCA1, uh, which is the open cycle, this oscillation is diminished. Almost no exist, all right? And uh, also uh, look at some of the gene expression where you're in the lockout LHY, CCA1 and the LHY of expressed ones. You see some, this, in this case, we look at particularly the PA metabolizing genes. You can see some of the genes undergo opposite in terms of expression level changes. Uh, importantly, this also impact the seed oil accumulation. You see when you lock it out, this double lock out, you decrease the oil content. When you overexpress the LHY and also CSA1, you see an increase of oil content, the alteration of the clock across this type of uh, changes. So what we believe here now is that th there is a reciprocal interplay regulation between the clock and the lipid metabolism. On one hand, the clock, of course, can regulate the expression of genes and which will make lipids. On the other hand, some of those lipid metabolite, in this case, phosphatidic acid, they can actually interact with the clock directly actually, you know, uh, uh, then impact the, uh, its regulation or the output of the clock. And this type of interactions is uh, important for uh, how plant, uh, uh, you know, uh, a grow respond to different to different uh, uh, particular environmental cues. Uh, here, I want to make a few uh, observations. You know, this is, you know, we know clock is important, regulated or for, you know, many aspects our life, plants life too. We know a lot how the clock is regulated regulated metabolism because you know one of the primary regulation is through the, the regulated gene expression, you know, because those bunch of transcription factors. But how metabolism actually regulate clock function is much less known. But on the other hand, you know, we do know metabolism impact the clock. Like in the feeding experiments in animals, particularly feeding mouse and this, or the high fat diet, or the 16 zero fatty acids specifically, they can influence the animal clock gene expression uh, and, uh, and so on. And also the energy status is particularly redox, like NAD plus over NADH ratios, and they impact clock functions. And in plants, also we know the sugar photosynthesis can entrain clock, but again, those are metabolic input. But we hope our study actually shed a light, we identified a, basically a molecular modulators which can inter uh, collect the metabolism with the clock functions. Of course, the implication will be, you know, how does clock misalignment reflect in the mutants and also can relate to some of the uh, uh, conditions lead to the altered lipid metabolism. You know, this could be, of course, in human systems, there will be the metabolic disorders. But in, pl in plants, we see this alteration accumulation of uh, lipids. And uh, can then other, of course, could this process be modulated? You know, so then you can alleviate some of this physiological or pathological impact associated with clock malfunctions. In our case, of course, will this be, you know, what will be potential applications in terms of for improving uh, uh, oil production? And uh, this some ideas we have been testing and pursuing uh, those ones. Uh, so I think here now, uh, gone through quickly on the three topics, and I want to do a very quick summary. Uh, the lipid, why is the member lipid tower for actually is important in the lipid production, and the production itself could through the lipid the acyclin, and also could be regulation of membrane trafficking process signaling, and uh, is I indicated in the later part of the talk, and the signaling regulation is the metabolic interaction with transcription aspects. This is the upcoming, I think it's important aspects uh, to regulate uh, 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 the gene expression and also the organismal response uh, in plant growth and development. 
One specific example is given is the phosphatidic acid. And this is uh, uh, now become a class of cellular mediator, not only in plants, and also in humans, in animal or other systems. And then we have shown that the PA is very dynamic. They can interact with different proteins and some of these interactions lead us to identify a specific process it regulates. And they can modulate protein in different way, you know, uh, activity, membrane tethering, uh, locations, and also DNA protein interactions, as I showed uh, here. Uh, you know, in the signal learning area, location, location, location is everything, you know, in terms of regulate uh, cellular process. And also the PA, I touched upon this molecular species actually matter. That actually may be a key determinant in terms of PA interact a specific process, specific proteins, because there are many PA molecular species. Uh, this new area is opening up is this PA signaling in nuclei. I think this is very exciting. Uh, uh, but uh, how, P, what's the PA dynamics in the nuclei, how they interact, how it's produced, the functions which opens uh, many uh, questions. Uh, I think uh, uh, with that, this actually, this is a, where this actually shows why PA is unique, but I think we're short of time. I mean, if you, any of you have questions, I can talk about this. Uh, lastly, but not the least, is acknowledgement and the work I produce uh, presented here done primarily by two very talented postdoc, Sancho Kim, uh, Guangqin uh, Chai. Guangqin Chai now has her, his own lab and left the lab. Uh, then the a number of people contribute to different aspects like Shai Bin contribute to this uh, sensor uh, aspects. Uh, the uh, collaborations, important collaborations that are listed here Peter Dioslo at Danforth, you know, he actually is a clock expert. We collaborate uh, on this aspect. Uh, Ruth Wealthy at K State, this is my old colleague and also a longtime collaborator who has still collaborating. And the other ones I identified also in this uh, uh, during my talk. Uh, this early work of this, uh, this regulation of oil production is supported by the uh, DOG, EFRC, and RPRE projects. And recently, uh, the NIH we found, uh, has picked up the interest, uh, the, the, the support to further look into uh, our study, this uh, clock metabolic interaction. And uh, our lipidosiglonin and the phospholipase work has been supported by NSF and the USDA over the years. And without the support, uh, none of this can be possible. With that, uh, I appreciate your attention to attending the seminar and uh, I'll be like to answer any questions you have. Yeah, thank you, Xiaomi. Yeah, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself. Okay, I can start. <laughs> um, so um, the AHL4, uh, this gene, is yeah. particular expressed in the... Thank you. Hello. Do that again. Okay, go ahead. I can ask later, yeah. Oh. Yes. No, you say that again. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, so I was just wondering how this, how your idea of um, reciprocal regulation between circadian clock and lipid metabolism um, would impact like sleep glucose metabolism in humans? Have well, we been? Yeah, at this moment, of course, everything's on know. plants. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, everything's on plants and uh, the, the wither that the energy, energy homeostasis and metabolism in animal systems, you know, of course, that's a, you know, uh, we have not working on that, you know, and the implication will be, if you produce more or less lipids, those things will be, has to be connected with how carbohydrate metabolism, because that is, right. uh, that's the initial uh, sources, but particularly in plants where the photosynthesis is first coming into the sugar form and then supplied as lipid. Uh, so the, the, 
you know, that, that, that could be uh, uh, further locked into, yeah. But okay. in terms of humans, of course, that is the kind of probably, at this time, extrapolation is not there, yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fascinating though. Thank you so, so much. Sorry if I interrupted anyone. <laughs> I'm trying to get it to work. Thank you. No one else? No, I will ask. <laughs> okay. So this, this uh, uh, AI child for uh, yeah. right, um, uh, involved in the lipid degradation during seed germination. So my question is that, you know, in some process, we don't want to um, lipid, we don't want the lipid degradate that fast. Now for seed germination, right, it's critical. So the, this, um, transcript, this transcriptional factor uh, um, is a universally expressed or only expressed in the um, seed germination stage? Yeah, it's a, a very, very, that's right. Yeah, that's the excellent question here. You're thinking a lot of, on the other uh, side is that, you know, can this be a save in the seeds maturation, mm -hmm. you know, development process? If this process is, is expressed and then actually you decrease the oil content, that's mm -hmm. right, decrease the oil accumulation uh, with just, does this actually impact that or not? The short answer is that actually this transcriptor has an impact, has an impact on the seed oil production, all right? So, mm -hmm. Uh, it is ex it's expressed highly in the germination process. It's not exclusively only in seed germination. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's a process. It's a process. Now you actually is one of the very good candidates manipulate mm -hmm. in developing seeds, but mm -hmm. then you try to see without impact. Mm -hmm. yeah, without impact of the germination setting the establishment. So that's a challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. very so good question. Yeah. Yeah, another question related to your the um, the relationship between the uh, circadian clock and the PA. So, so circadian clock definitely affects the flowering time, right? So how about the PA? Um, also, kind of the uh, sneak sneak in that pathway or not? Yeah. So the 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 PA that like in, in our case in this study we have not found. Uh, uh, this is alterations uh, in, um, in in flower time uh, uh, yet because there's a way uh, the, the you know the, the manipulation like for example the way I have manipulated the PA content in a way where like say for for seven D for example uh, but that's a trough of them you know so when we manipulate one or two lockout let's use a double lockout a single lockout uh, really we identify any phenotype. That's sort of what we have to use the result because we don't have a 12 pure, pure D lure mutant. In that case, power plants may not be able to survive. Uh, but we have to use the, like, uh, the inhibitor to treat the seedlings to see some of these modulations. Yeah. Uh, uh, so with the, with the PA, you know, we can we find the manipulated PA content or alter the development of the flowering time or not. Uh, uh, so remain open. But there are examples, people have reported like when you manipulate PC, mm -hmm. the PC interact with like a, the FT, you know, the flower. Locus. Locus, uh, yeah, uh, uh, the flower timing uh, protein, and that can impact flowering. So that lipids uh, interactions uh, has been reported, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but the PC can be hydrolyzed in PA very readily, you know, uh, uh, in plants, yeah. Yeah, I think the PA is very powerful. <laughs> you voted in so many processes. Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 one of the very key uh, lipid mediator. Uh, uh, yeah, not only in plants but also in animal systems. Yeah. But how can it interact with the other, let's say, proteins through what what which way? You see, uh, this is here, here I go. I so uh, you see, I still can share my slides. I still share. You still can say my slides. That's right. Yes. Yeah. yeah, here and how I prepared this, I saw there may be a question here could be answered, you know. <laughs> There's so many lipids, that's right. Mm -hmm. Why PA is so special, that's mm -hmm. right. Why not a PC? Why not a PG? Why not a PS? That's mm -hmm. right. But uh, we, uh, and in this case here, it shows two aspects of PA. You know, PA is not a bilayer lipids. This is what we call the hexaclo two-faced lipids. It has this corn shape, because small head and large tails. 
and does not pack in the, uh, so what this in membranes, they'll cause this kind of curvature of membranes, you know, this negative curvature of membranes. This curvature is shown at the bottom, can enhance the protein interactions and also enhance the membrane trafficking, the vascular trafficking process. This is number one in terms of biophysical effect. The mm -hmm. other one is showing on the top. On the top, this is called a pH dependent dual deprotonation. And uh, this long sentence, electrostatic hydrogen mm -hmm. bonding. Basically, uh, what, well, wait a minute, they're saying my running out of power. Maybe just, maybe I just turn it on. Um, by the way, already okay. one, if anyone needs to leave, you just go ahead to leave, okay, and leave. Yeah, yeah we will discuss probably a little bit more. <laughs> That's, yeah, all right. So in this case, we're now, you see, mm -hmm. this is a head group, right? it's showing on the top. Depending on the pH, this can be totally protonated or double deprotonated. When this is double deprotonated and then interact with protein, you know, this through a lot of the lot of only the electrostatic interactions, but also through hydrogen bonding. In East, the PA has proposed as a pH sensor, you know, in the pH sensor. Mm -hmm. And in uh, our work collaboration with uh, Dr. Zhang, you know, in this uh, use a PA sensor, we, uh, uh, he did detect this PA, the pH dependent PA protein interaction. That's important in plant response, say, uh, sort stress. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this in this aspect, PA is rather unique lipids in terms of interaction with proteins and also impact with the membrane structures. Yeah, so this uh, there are some this uh, uh, there are nice uh, uh, MR study done with those interactions and demonstrate those interactions. And uh, so one of the early effect of the PA is in the vascular trafficking, particularly in this slur uh, type of vesicle, like cup type of vesicle trafficking and the PA uh, is an important modulator uh, in plant, uh, in animal systems, yeah. But uh, uh, for the transcriptal factors, right, they function in the nucleus, um, yeah. the membrane. That's right, PA is, PA is, PA is produced in the, in the nuclei, that's right. Mm -hmm. PA also, they have this here top of membrane is this, uh, uh, mm -hmm. In the member form, uh, with the lipids, they also go through transition from monomer to the uh, to the uh, uh, liposome formation process. That's right. So you mm -hmm. have monomer of lipids, PA. PA, in terms of water solubility, is better than some other lipids. So they could be uh, in the monomeric form too, bind to uh, those ones. Also, they can tether the proteins to the membrane. Uh, in in the nuclei, meaning they can bind to a uh, protein which could be not membrane associated or could be membrane associated. Mm. Yeah. So there's this uh, critical micro concentration depending of course of different PA species. Uh, you know, they, they try to from monomeric form to uh, the membrane bound form. Yeah. Interesting, yeah. Mm. No other question? I probably have last one, <laughs> if not. So for the sensor, you talk about this pH affects the PA, and not affect uh, associated with the PA interaction with other um, factors, right? So, but the fret sensor, you use that uh, uh, apoplasmic uh, uh, localized targeted sensor. You know, in the cell wall space, pH is acid. So in general, this acid will affect lots of the fluorescence proteins. Um, yeah, so the ones we tested is uh, uh, the, uh, the plasma membrane tethered one, which, mm -hmm. is, which is facing, no, facing inside the cell, not the apoplastic side. Oh, it's the inside. It's the inside, yeah. So uh, that is tethered okay. to, okay. Uh, to the inside of the membrane. Yeah, no, inside, yeah, this is a side of, uh, the plasmic side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so yeah, face cytosol. That's right. Okay, okay, okay. I see. So that's I thought. Oh, perfect. I mean, <laughs> the fluorescence protein can resist to the uh, acid uh, environment. That's cool. Yeah, but that's that. that well, we're not, not the outside. Yeah, it would be yeah, nice yeah. to have an outside probe too. Yeah. Okay. 
Any more questions? No. Okay. Let's thank uh, Sam again for the great talk. Uh, okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Wing. Thank you for attending. Of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, U of I. Thank you. Bye. All right.